All right. Well, welcome to another episode of the Ice Team Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Durham, where we talk about ice fishing and beyond. And we are so fortunate today to have as our guest, Jesse Thalman of Thalman's Guide Service. Jesse, thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. I love to be here. Uh, you know, we even got to talk for just a little bit as I was setting up the podcast and everything. And I enjoy talking fishing with you so much because we have a lot of commonalities, both being fishing guides and the whole educational part of it. And of course, that's what we try to do here on the Ice Team podcast. And to begin with, uh, I want to say where where we are broadcasting from. We are sitting in the famous Purim Public Library right now in mm-hmm. Purim, Minnesota. That's right. <laughs> I, I stepped out of the vehicle and I could smell the overwhelming scent dog food. Of, of dog food. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yep. And, and that's a big part of the economy that's here. Right. A lot of people work here and there's some really cool different manufacturing places here in Purim. Uh, but you've got a really close connection here too. Tell us about that. So I, uh, not only do I live locally here, um, I'm also the head coach of the Purim high school team. Um, so that brings me, um, a connection to the area, to the people in Purim. And, uh, it's just a, a great place with a lot of good people and, and a lot of people that love fishing up here. So. And when you say you're the coach of the team, the high school fishing team. Yes, correct. Yep. And I, I had a question about that right away. And that is, is it only open water or do you guys do ice fishing as well? We, the first year, um, we did a little bit of ice fishing. Now it's kind of more oriented towards open water, I guess. We, uh, we do like a raffle. We used to do like a, a, a tournament or a, a tournament in the winter, just a one-time deal. Um, we kind of got away from that just because every time we tried to have it, we had a lot of weather issues, you know, blizzards and stuff oh, like yeah. that. So it was just much easier to do the raffle in the winter. But the summertime, um, that's the main focus, I guess. So we got... 26 different schools um, all in our conference and uh, they all compete against each other five times a summer um, like every other Thursday and then we have a team championship at the end in, in September. And how many how many kids do you have on the team? So Purim we again a nice area with a lot of people that are really into fishing so we actually have a pretty big roster. I had 62 kids on my roster this wow. year and we're the second biggest roster in the in the conference. So I think Fergus Falls has like 80 some, and they'd be the only ones that are bigger than us. It's absolutely bananas how this high school fishing thing has absolutely exploded, exponentially exploded. It's one of the fastest growing sports out there right now. You know, it followed the the trap team, you know I mean? That became yeah. huge, what, five, six, seven years ago. And then the, the fishing thing just followed like two or three years after that and basically just following the same steps and just growing huge, you know? I mean, we... We went from 16 schools the first year to, I think, 22 schools the second year. And we went from 300 kids to, like, 500-some kids, you know what I mean, from year one to year two. And it's just growing and growing and growing even more. So, well, One of the cool honors for me is Jesse had invited me to come and speak yes. to your high school team. And, and what an absolute honor. But one thing that really stuck out to me, uh, number one, that the school superintendent, Mitch, was there for the meeting and everything. I mean, he gave me a tour of the school. It was obvious that administration is 100% behind this. Yes, Mitch Mitch was actually one of the guys that were there from the beginning that got this kind of set up. You know, I mean, it was a bunch of guys that, um, you know, superintendents and people that said, hey, we want to create a fishing team. Do you guys want to too? You know what I mean? And it just, they sent letters to a lot of different schools in the area and a lot of schools, you know, decided to make a team and, and join the conference and now we got 26 of them so that's cool but the other thing that really stuck out is after i had finished speaking and you and i were talking with mitch these two girls came in they came into the the small gymnasium that we were in and they were both wearing volleyball gear they mm-hmm. both had knee pads on and they had their uniforms and whatever and they came in and right away uh they said sorry coach sorry we couldn't be here for the meeting we had trap shooting right after school, and now we have J.O. Volleyball. So they skipped their fishing meeting to go do trap shooting and J.O. Volleyball. I mean, isn't that just incredible, the opportunities that youth have right now? And some people say, well, it's too much or it's this and that and whatever. I think there's a lot of, of adults that are jealous. 
Oh, absolutely. Like, I, I never dreamt of a fishing team back when I was right? in high school. You know, there wasn't even trap teams back when I was in high right. school. So um, it's come a long way, and there's just more offerings to these students, you know, year after year. And I think that's good. You know, give, I do too. give these kids more options to, to be outside, be in the outdoors. And, and, and some of these things are lifelong sports, you know what I mean? So, Well, I, I think about it. If there was a high school fishing team when I was in high school, I 100% would have been in it. Mm-hmm. And there's a good chance that I wouldn't have played other sports just because I would have been so ingrained in that because that's really where my passion lied. Mm-hmm. And um, I think I think that would be true for a lot of kids. Oh, I agree. Absolutely. And it's nice now that we have that option to give those kids that that re- or that opportunity, you know. How did how did it come to fruition that you became the high school fishing coach for Perm? So once Mitch and a few, like I said, a few of the other superintendents in the area kind of got this thing rolling, Mitch reached out to me, and uh, I didn't know Mitch at the time. That's how I got to know Mitch. And uh, he reached out to me and just asked me if I'd, you know, want to come over and help coach these kids and, and uh, you know, be the coach of Perham's team. And, and at that time, Henning, the home, my hometown, mm-hmm. didn't have a team, so I was more than willing to come over here and help these kids, absolutely. So what happens now if Henning has a team, they do did. they have? They, they do did. have a team. They, they just got a team here this last year. So, oh they, no, they did approach me, but I was, uh, you know, I've been here in Perm for three or four years and decided just to to stay with the program that sure. that I've been in with, and and I kind of know the kids and and then families and stuff like that. So I decided just to stay over here. Now nobody's given you a hard time about that, have they? No, not yet, not yet. No, <laughs> it's good. I, you know, it's good to see. I just. It's good to see Henning have a team. I'm glad. You know, my kid will probably be fishing on Henning's team. I actually pulled him over to Purim this year. But, <laughs> but going forward, he'll probably be fishing on, sure. t- on, on Henning's team. There. <laughs> so let's back up just a little bit then. Mm-hmm. Give us a little bit of your background then just with fishing in general. And, I mean, obviously you have a very successful guide business, both open water and on the ice. But let's talk about where your roots started from mm-hmm. with fishing. How did, how did this snowball effect begin you know it all started with actually both my grandpas both my grandpas were very very avid fishermen so I mean I got to go with either either one both of them would take me all the time so um both of them ingrained the love of fishing at a very young age you know and I had and I had one one grandpa that was you know um they 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 had two different styles, so I, I got to learn a couple different ways to fish. They both were panfish fishermen. That's what, that's why I love panfish, of mm-hmm. course. But you know, my one grandpa, he was very conventional. Like like actually, the methods that I use today are the same way that that he taught me growing up. Right, you know, where the other grandpa, he was more let's go to the weeds, let's pitch bobbers. You know, he always just had good shoreline spots so we could just go out, have fun, and just pitch bobbers, just like. You know, like a kid growing up watching your bobber right. go down, right? Other grandpa was very more, you know, sophisticated. We're working the weed edge. We're vertical jigging. We're, we're doing this. You know what I mean? So I learned some of that um, finesse fishing, and then I also got to, you know, enjoy the relaxation of growing up and watching that bobber go down and stuff like that. But either way, like every weekend, I was either out with one of my grandpas going fishing somewhere. There's still something very cathartic about watching a bobber go down. I still get excited yeah, watching a bobber go down. For sure. I get excited watching my customers' bobbers go down. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes I'm more excited than them. <laughs> oh, I 100% agree with that. 100%. <laughs> but, uh, no, I mean, like I said, uh, if, if it wasn't for my grandpas, I don't know that I'd have such a passion for, for fishing. You sure. know what I mean? And, and then, you know, we had a lake cabin growing up, and my one grandpa, you know, as I grew up and got a little bit older, he would take me out there every single day. After he got off work, I'd jump in the van with him, and he'd bring me to the lake, he may, he may not even go fishing. He would just hang out in the cabin. But I had a little 14-foot boat, little, you know, I think it started with a three-horse Johnson, you know, one of those things with the lever that you, you know, oh, to yeah. get the throttle going. Yeah. Um, started with that, graduated to a 10-horse, you know, and I could get over the, across the lake, you know, and uh, just was going out every day, every night by myself, just in my boat, just fishing. Now, did both of those grandfathers live really close by? Yes, uh, yeah. So my one grandpa lived in the same town as me mm-hmm. that I grew up in, and my other grandpa was 15 minutes away, just oh. in the neighboring town. Sure. So, are they still around? They are not. Both of them have passed away now. So, you know. now it's your turn to pass on that passion. That's right. To That's all these high school kids, absolutely, and of course your own and, kids and my own too. Kids too. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Well, then, how did you get into guiding? Where Where did that all start from? You know, um, I've always had a passion for fishing. 
I always wanted to get in the industry somehow, whether it be guiding, whether it be tournament fishing, whether, you know what I mean? Just growing up, you know, that's the great thing about fishing. There's, there's so many different avenues to get into the industry, sure. right? Mm-hmm. And, and make money in the industry too. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, um, I guess, you know, it started by just, just fishing, fishing, fishing. I was going after um, large pan fish, of course, right? And started to gain a little bit of following social media because we post pictures, you know what I mean? And eventually guys were just like, hey, what would you take me out fishing, you know? And at first it was like, man, I don't want to give up my hot spots. It was like, it was like, uh, what would you charge me to take me to these hot spots? Exactly, exactly. You know, you know how it goes, right? So eventually just got to thinking and, 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 uh, you know, and eventually just the, the messages kept coming and coming and I thought, well, heck, why don't I just try starting this part time and, and doing it, you know, on weekends and stuff like that. And it just kind of took off, you know, we started weekends and pretty soon weekends rolled into evenings after work. And finally it was, you know, it gets to a point where you're just gone all the time and you got to kind of make that decision where, Hey, do I just go full time into guiding or, you know, I got to, or I lay back off the guiding and, and right. you know what I mean? Cause I'm gone all the time. Right. I got young kids, you know? Um, so, um, I decided to jump head first and, and leave my corporate job and just start guiding. And um, I kind of had, you know, when I left the corporate job, I kind of had a, a summer's worth of business already kind of in the books already. You know, when I left, and I, I think I left my job, my, my real job or my, my corporate job in like, I don't know, it was like springtime. It was like April, March, April. Well, starting May, I had... I had a list of trips, you know, already May, May, June, July. So I knew I could get through the summer. It was just what I'm going to do in the winter time. Right. But luckily it just kind of all came together after all my summer trips. A lot of those guys booked winter trips and it just kind of kept me afloat and it just kept going and it just kept, uh, you know, word of mouth is huge. You know, you have good trips and it just, it, it, it turns into more, I guess. So, you know, uh, how many years have you been guiding now? Oh, full time six. Okay. I know, I know even for myself, having, having done it now 30 years, there's still times where I go, I wonder if this summer or this winter is going to be different. Mm-hmm. Or, and even though you get calls when you're booked and you, you can't, you don't have enough time in the day to mm-hmm. take everybody out, but there's still times in the back of your head because it's not guaranteed every time, every year that you go, I wonder if this is going to be the same. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you after 30 years, Jesse, it's going to be the same. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so you could fall back on that. I think, I think, and, and everything that I hear about you too, I mean, obviously I, I watch what you do on, sh- on social media and you know, just the way that you interact with people, even online. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have so much respect, not only for people, but for the fish too. Mm-hmm. A- and so I'm wondering when you were younger and you would go out with your grandfathers, what was it like in terms of keeping fish? And has that changed at all now that you've, you know, gotten older and, and since that time too, kind of the expectation socially, not on social media, well, on social media too, but just socially in society has changed in terms of what is acceptable and unacceptable for keeping fish. So, you know, I think growing up with my grandpas, you know, they're in that older mentality where, you know, you, you pretty much, you caught it, you threw it in the live well and you yeah. went home and it was for dinner. Right. And as a kid, I didn't realize it. You know what I mean? I just, did what grandpa told me, you know, caught fish, right. threw them in the live well. It was good. As we got older, you know, you start to, we started to learn the, you know, the science behind the releasing the big ones, the genetics, the things like that. And it was nice that when I got into high school, I, I started to learn that and, and realize that and, and started to do that. And then not only did I do that, then grandpa kind of caught on too, you know what I mean? So, you know, towards the end when we would go fishing, he, oh, that one's too big. Let's throw that one back. He would have never done that when we were a kid. I mean, that would have been in the live all day long. Did you know it, what I mean? Did it take him a while to kind of embrace that? I think so. You know, I mean, it, uh, you know, I think it, it did take him a little bit. But once he once he realizes, like, you know, hey, we can take a bunch of these 8 inches home. We don't need to take these 10 inches home, right? Like, right. It, 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 uh, I think it made sense. It all clicked to him, too, eventually, and that was nice. You know what I mean? So, um, but, yeah, I we... I 
like nowadays I'm a huge advocate of throwing those big ones back. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and the genetics they play and the you know, just there's so much science behind it now and we we're starting to realize it. So we uh we had a, a guide client last weekend who caught a big crappie, a fifteen inch crappie, and I was telling you about that before the show. And the cool part was, you know, I told him you've got some some options here. Mm-hmm. And and he he fished a bit, but he says, Well, what are those options? And I said, Well, legally you can keep this fish and eat it, but I wouldn't recommend it. And it's important, too, to, to tell people that. I, w- I wouldn't recommend it. And, and in all honesty, it's not necessarily because it's going to taste bad. Right. It's because you can get those genetics back into the lake. Because that fish can reproduce, and equally important, that somebody else has a chance to catch that fish. Absolutely. I mean, I was telling somebody uh, just this morning who was asking about it, and I said, you know what makes it easier for me as a guide if I have trophy fish swimming around in the lake, so if I can encourage people to put them back. And, and so when I had mentioned, you know, you can, you can mount this fish, you can do a fish, a skin mount, mm-hmm. or you can do a fiberglass reproduction. We already have the measurements on the fish mm-hmm. and we have the photo. Or some people don't want a fish on their wall. Some people don't want that. And, you know, you can go online and you can find companies that do uh, photo printing. You can even get it the photo in resin where it's just an outline of your body and the fish Mm -hmm. and it's standing up kind of like a statue. You can put that on your desk or what I encouraged him to do was do that and put it on the back of his toilet because if you have guests that come to the house, they're probably not going into your office space, Right. but they're all going to use the bathroom. So then you can kind of brag about it. Yep. Absolutely. That's a great idea. Do you have, do you have clients sometimes that you really need to coach on releasing fish? Yes. Oh, absolutely. hundred percent. So, um, you still, I think that, I think that in today's world, there's a lot more people that realize what we're talking about, that we should release the big ones, but there's still a lot of guys that are engraved in that old mentality where, Hey, yeah. we're, we're, you know, everything we catch, we're, we're taking home or we want to keep the big ones or, you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of meat on that fish, especially, especially the older generation. Right. And I get it right. Like back when they were young kids, like they didn't fish for sport, right? It was fishing for food, right? Like you went out yeah. and you caught dinner. Like, it, you know what I mean? It right. wasn't like you were going to go sport fishing and catch or release a bunch of fish. No, you were going to go grab a bunch of fish, throw them in your live well, and take them home for dinner, right? Like that's that was just the mentality back then, you know? And so I, I understand that. Um, um, but it's nice to be able to, on the guide trips, like I said, educate some of those guys yeah. and, and, and tell them why we release them and, and here's why. And maybe your great grandkids could catch them, you know what I mean? And stuff like that. So um, I think guys are, are, are becoming more receptive to that. But there's definitely a lot of guys that we still have to coach and explain, you know, why we release, especially like those big gills, those 10 inch males, you know what I mean? Why we're releasing them and why they're so important to the water, you know, to the lake. Right. Yeah. And, and, I, I would disagree with you in just a small part of it. And you were talking about the older generation that it's most of them. I do see that though as being passed down to some degree. If if you have somebody that fishes with their grandfather or grandmother, or whatever, and that's the way that they've operated their entire lives. If they don't have kind of like a, a fishing uh, crew or group of friends that are into catch and release, mm-hmm that they still carry on that mentality. And so we see that in the younger generations too. So passing on that infor- information is ultra important. Huge. But, you know, like when, when we caught that big one last weekend, uh, there was a guy out on the ice that I talked to in length who lived on the lake. Mm-hmm. And, and we know that it's all public water, right? Mm-hmm. But you still, you know, there's a gray area between what is legal and what is ethical. Mm-hmm. And so had this guy chose to keep that fish, you know, I, I don't know if the land order would have said, uh, you know, no, no, you got to you gotta put that back and really gotten on him. Or if the land owner would have gone, yeah, that was a good one to keep. I wish I would have caught it for the frying pan. You just don't know. And, and though they don't own the water or anything like that, mm-hmm. you don't know who you're going to run into out on the water. And, you know, in today's day and age mm-hmm. with rage in you oh, know, certain yeah. areas of life. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't run into that on the ice, but um, you never know how somebody's going to go off about, you know, keeping a fish or not. Who knew, who knew that we'd be at this, st- this point oh, yeah, in society where people would have an argument about whether a fish should be kept or released or whatever. But I, I commend you on educating others about it. 
So talking about that, talking about the, the big bluegills and those 10 inch plus fish, those magical unicorn fish, mm-hmm. what does it take for a lake to put out fish like that? Where, what are you seeing the commonalities in the bodies of water that you regularly see trophy size bluegill? What are some of the commonalities you see between those, those lakes? You know, a lot of the a lot of the lakes that we're fishing that have those big pound bluegills in them are pretty small, fertile lakes. You know, we're not going to those huge lakes. It's it's a lot of these smaller lakes that are very fertile, have a very good forage system, um, very very good cabbage based in them. Um, so we're we're hitting a lot of those smaller lakes, and 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 the toughest thing is finding them, right? We've got a thousand forty eight lakes in this county, right? right. And uh, to narrow down the ones that have them and the ones that don't is, you know, there's just so many options, right? But I do a lot of um, I do a lot of like reading on the DNR website, right? Yeah. So like the first thing guys always ask me, what like, what's what's the first thing I can do to find big gills? Well, one. You got to make sure that lake has big gills in it, right? Right. Like, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean. The first thing is you got to make sure that that lake has the nice potential. fish in it. Yeah, absolutely. has that potential. And and I so I read a lot of surveys. You know, if I drive by a lake, I'm like, oh, I know, I've never, you know, I I don't know anything about that lake. I'll get home. I'll think. I'll remember it in my head. I'll get home. I'll go on the DNR website. I'll read the surveys. I'll read the summary of the fishery. I mean, all that stuff tells me information. The net surveys. You know, here's what you can say when you're reading those net surveys. Only a not even a quarter of the fish in the lake are caught in those net surveys. Right. So if you see oh, not, a, yeah, not one or close. two yeah. in a 10 inch plus gill range, there's more than one or two, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So that's stuff I look for. A lot of things I'm looking for too is like when you're reading those summaries, like they give the status <laughs> of the fishery down below out under the net survey. Um, they, a lot of times will tell you how fast those fish are growing and at what, you know, how many percentage are over a certain age, you know what I mean? So like, Bluegills, they'll say, you know, there's 70% of the bluegills are over seven and a half inches, right? You know what I mean? So I know that there's a good population of fish over seven and a half inches out there. You know what I mean? So I'll read that and I'll see how fast they're growing. You know, a typical bluegill will only grow about an inch a year, right? So your nine, 10, 11 inch bluegills, they're they're old fish. I mean, they've been around a decade. You know what I mean? Because if you look at the lifespan of a bluegill, you're about there. Yeah, yeah. Abs- absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, you know, they're, they're old fish. So you, you can grow three trophy bucks in the time it takes you to grow one trophy bluegill. So um, they are special fish, and, and that's a big reason why we, we try to treat them special too. So I love that analogy because I think that puts it into perspective for a lot of people that it really does take a long time. Mm-hmm. I mean, even think about a, a kid. You have a, a uh, eight-year-old kid that catches a big bluegill like that, and you say, well, we want to keep it to let them eat the fish that they caught or whatever. That fish is older than the kid. It is, yeah. And, you know, if guys are like that and they want to take some of those big ones home, like this is this is a big misconception in the bluegill world. Most guys think, oh, we got to release those big females. They got all the eggs. Yes, that's true. They do have all the eggs, but you are much better off releasing those big 10-inch males. I mean, those are the ones that pass all the genetics on. Those females, they don't pass the genetics. The males right. pass the genetics. Um, if you don't have those males in the system, when those females lay those eggs, if you don't got those big males guarding them, those bass and everything else will come in and eat those, and then you'd have zero reproduction anyway. So you've right. got to have those males in there protecting those beds and stuff like that. So there's a lot of you know, um, reasoning behind why we release them too, you know. And another thing is too, when a, when a bluegill's young, if there's big 10 inch bluegills in the system, when he's two, three years old, he's gonna put all his growth, all his focus into growing big so he can compete with those big bluegills when he gets older, right? If there's no big bluegills in the system for him to try to compete with when he gets older, when they're two, three year olds, two to three year old, they instead of putting that energy into growth, a lot of times it goes into spawning out at an early age and then you get a stunted population. Right. So another another reason why we try to release the big ones. Exactly. And um, I think it would just be frugal to say, if you get a big one, just let it go, no matter what gender it is. I, yep, absolutely. <laughs> let, let them go, that's let them our, grow. That's our mentality. Now, in, and in some cases, I mean, like when we're fishing crappies, right, and we get a big crappie, well, sometimes depending on the spot, we may be pulling it out of a 25 foot hole. So if it comes out, eyes are, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. There's some there's some cases where 
it's more ethical to keep the fish than to throw it back because it's going to die anyways. Yep. You know what I mean? So there are certain cases like that. Now, obviously, we try to avoid that as at all possible. But Now, on these lakes that you're finding big sunfish, are you typically finding them in similar areas? Like, are you... Are, out of all these pound plus bluegills you've caught, mm -hmm. and that's a whole nother topic I want to get into is the whole length versus weight conversation. Mm -hmm. But is it like, okay, boy, 10 feet, we've caught more one pound plus bluegills out of 10 feet, or is it we've caught more one pound plus bluegills out of 20 feet, basin fish, or is it a mixture of all of it? Mixture of all of it. Just depends on the time of the year. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're when it's when it's spring, they're all grouped up in shallow bays in that warm water, feasting basically. Just right. like they're putting on the feed bags, just getting ready for the spawn, right? So they're just bulking up. So that's a great time, but we're literally fishing them in five, six feet of water. You yeah. know what I mean? Super shallow. Um, and then we follow them out. You know, once they you know once they go on beds. I mean, that's another good time to catch your big ones. You know, you're sight fishing them. I mean, you can see them. Um, but then once they move out to the weed edge, then we're just vertical jigging, typically in that 12 to 14 foot range. Yeah. I mean, even sometimes shallower, even up to 10, 9 feet, you know. I mean, but depends on where your cabbage is on your lake. You know, a lot of times we're hitting cabbage edges. A lot of times we're hitting like humps and stuff like that. Um, those are kind of mid lake structures of what I look for, you know, most of the season, I guess. Yeah. So, so now, talking ice fishing specifically mm -hmm. and we're in january we're getting towards towards the end of january mm -hmm. that what areas are you finding big fish on right now bluegills we are still working cabbage yeah. in 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 winter time i would say that we work cabbage 90 percent of the winter in the winter you know what i mean like um whereas like yeah i would just say like pretty much we are focused on cabbage. Like if you find green cabbage, there's going to be some nice fish nearby. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like typically. So. Well, I mean, it's, it's habitat. Right. It's, it's their home. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times we'll find it, you know, and that's, a lot of times we use cameras for that. So we'll find good green cabbage, you know what I mean? Make sure it's green, make sure it's alive. And then we'll just drill out that, we'll drill out that line. You know what I mean? And just keep, keep following it down until we find them. So. Do you tend to find uh, big pan fish more like it, let's say you've got a weed flat that goes off into the primary drop off and you know obviously the weeds end you've got that definitive weed line do you typically find more bluegills on the drop and on the edge of those weeds or do you find them mixed all up through throughout the flat a lot of times we're fishing right in the weeds yep. right in the middle of it yep absolutely or if there's um and sometimes, you know, in our cabbage, we got mud that's nearby too. And sometimes we'll work that that edge because they like those bugs that come out of that mud too. So they're they're over there, and then they come back into the cabbage for cover. You know what I mean? It's a little bit of both. So we use, we we like spots. We have a few spots like that that we utilize quite a bit actually. So so if you're fishing the weeds a lot, I mean, people talk about basin fish all the time. Mm -hmm. and what do you say about that? We so. I mean, just personally, our focus, wintertime bluegills, mainly weeds. Um, but, for example, crappies, we're, yeah. we're hitting basins the whole time. Like, that's all we do is basin fish when we're fishing crappies, pretty much. So um, we definitely do a lot of basins um, when we're crappie fishing. But if we're talking strictly bluegills, I don't bleed into the basins a lot. I mean, obviously, if the bite dictates that, but a lot of times we can find our fish right in the cabbage. And a lot of those big, big bluegills are hunkered down right in the cabbage. So... You've, you've located the fish. Mm -hmm. You've determined, okay, here's the, the cabbage pile that I want to hit, and we've done this for the last five years, and we just know they're going to be here. What's your go-to presentation? What are you going to tie on the end of your line that you know that you have so much confidence in that you're going to drop it down the hole and you know that big fish is going to bite it? Pretty much a four-millimeter tungsten is what I start with every single time because it gives you the opportunity to downsize down to a three if you need to um, you can even upsize to a five if you want that a little bit more of a, a bend on your rod or, or you know that weight basically um, but I typically will start with a four millimeter tungsten um, and basically go from there a lot of times plastics sometimes waxies depending on what the fish want but um, always it seems like I'm, I'm a tungsten guy like a small tungsten guy this is what I use all the time you know there's a lot of guys that are spoons a lot of guys that that like that kind of thing. And I know there's a time and place for everything, right? But um, me personally, 
if you find me out on the lake and I'm heading out there, I got a four millimeter tungsten on. Waxies versus maggots. What would you pick? Well, I use waxies more than maggots. Okay. But that but part of that's availability. Like up here, it's it's just harder to find the spikes up here, you know, unless you get them shipped in and stuff like that. But um, I, I've ca- honestly I've caught more bigger bluegills on waxies than I have on spikes. I know a lot of people will probably argue that, you know, but um, me personally, I've caught way bigger bluegills on waxies. How are you hooking them? Dangle. Right under the head. Let them dangle. Let them dangle. Are you doing and I put multiple? as many as I can. As on many it. as you can. Absolutely. I'm all about big meat, big, big fish. You know, like we, summertime, we're using full crawlers. Like I don't break them up. Yep. We're, we're putting full, full crawlers on our hooks. We're, you know, I'm all about big, big meals. How important is it for the waxworm to be alive? I'm not, not, I mean, if it's black, we're not going to use it, right? But, like, <laughs> if it's if it's been on there for a while and it's dangling and it's dead, I have no problem with it because you're jigging anyways, right? You're creating that motion while you're jigging. I mean, if, unless you're sitting there with a dead stick, then I would say, well, you better put a, put, a, put a fresh one on. But, you know, typically we're jigging, so we're creating that motion anyways. So a live one, not I, – I don't pay too much attention to that, I guess. I think our listeners will appreciate that because those are little things that a lot of people don't think about. Mm-hmm. Until they're out fishing and they go, oh, I wonder if this brown wax worm is going to work or this one that's that's already in a pod of sawdust and I peel it out of there. Hey, you know what? I've went to a lake, opened up my tub of waxes, and they've all been brown. Well, guess what? <laughs> I used them and they caught fish. You know what I mean? So don't be afraid yeah. not to use them. I mean, you can certainly try, but I mean, not. Um, but if obviously if you have some good ones, I'd rather use them. But yeah, don't be afraid if you got all brown ones. I mean, they'll they'll work. There's times that my dad will actually gravitate towards the brown ones. Really? And okay. Con- and maybe convinced that's... convinced that they work better. I don't know if I agree with them or not, but I don't have to. I it's mean, kind of that motor fish. oil color, you know what I mean? Yeah, like... I suppose. <laughs> I mean, think about it. There's there's all kinds of different critters and creatures under there under the ice that have that same color. So mm-hmm. why wouldn't why wouldn't it? Unless it's a olfactory thing and they don't like the smell of it or something right right i don't usually like the smell of dead things but <laughs> as for fish yeah. it just depends it right just depends um what about uh if you're if you're specifically targeting crappies mm-hmm. then what's your go-to bait or is it the same it's the same thing we're using small four millimeter tungsten but we're tipping them with plastics we don't use any live bait on our crappies right it's all plastics have have you been through that progression like when you used to fish with your grandpas, were they like crappie minnow guys? Yeah, like yeah to- oh yeah, yeah. Back in the day, it was all you know, throw a dead stick down with your minnow, and then you're jigging with the other one. Absolutely, it was all. I don't remember the last time I bought a bag of minnows. Yeah. Can you believe that? Like no, I absolutely. We just, do. we just gravitated away from it. Like we just don't ever use minnows anymore. It's always now it's about plastics and getting on the fish. And once you're on them, they're pretty aggressive. You know yeah. what I mean? Like. Like, uh, we're looking for big schools of crappies. Once we get on them schools, like, there's so many of them, they're just aggressive, right? So right. They're, they're racing each other up to our bait, yeah. basically. You you're, know what I mean? You're, you've got competition. Exactly. That's and if, what it is. And if, you, if you're if you using crappie minnows, you're actually missing out on more bites. Oh, And absolutely. people go, oh, no, 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 because they want to eat it so badly. No, it's because it takes you so long, even just to hold them. Think about how many times you drop that tiny minnow. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, and, and the plastics, like literally you can catch 10 fish on one plastic before you have to, you know, put sure. another one on yeah. or something, you know what I mean? So, have whereas you, a minnow, you might only get one or two, you know what right, I mean? Right. Two if one, you're lucky. Yeah. I yeah. was going to say two if you're it's lucky. pretty much one and done. Uh, what about silkies? Have you played around with silkies? Silkies. Yeah, I do love silkies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they're, they, they, they are awesome. They, they, the way that they, um, just move in the water is phenomenal. So yeah, they are they are a big part of our arsenal as well. Do you have a favorite way that you hook them? I go right through the middle. Okay, it's T bone. T bone. Yeah. yeah. Let those let the let the, all the hairs kind of dangle off. And yep, absolutely. Do you do anything to prep the silky like the, before the first time that you drop it down? Like, are you are you clipping the length of the the silk? Are you? I'm not. I'm not. You, I like the length of them. I like. I do too. I like. I'm all about tentacles and dangles and, and stuff like that, right? Like something that's going to catch eyes, you know what I mean, down below. So I like the long hairs that are on each side, basically, and let them dangle on each side. One thing I, I personally like to do um, before I drop a silky down for the first time, first time out of the package, 
is I actually grip it really hard and I bite it and I rip it through my clenched teeth several mm. times on each side just to kind of fray that silk a little bit. Sure. Just so it moves a little bit more and is more absorbent. Because kind of like when you've, when you've caught fish with one and you put your rod away for the day, you come back the next day, it's kind of like y- you personally going to bed after taking a shower mm-hmm. and then your hair is just, just all yeah. over the place. Yep. Mine not so much anymore because I don't have as much as I used to. But back in my teen years. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> it's kind of like that. Um, and then when you put it back in the water, it takes a little bit for it to loosen up. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, kind of, I kind of, you know, I'll drop it and get it wet and I'll, you know, kind of pull on it, try to straighten it out a little bit. Um, but I just think try it that next time. Gives, gives it a little Absolutely. bit of movement. That's I, a good I think it's awesome. The, the crazy thing about silkies too is that you can use them for days. You're mm-hmm. talking oh, about yeah. a, like a plastic. You might catch 10 fish or 12 fish or 15 fish and you might have to, you know, there's a lot of readjustment. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's be honest. We talk about how convenient plastic bait is compared to live bait because you're not constantly rebaiting. But there is a bit of adjustment that oh, goes on absolutely. with plastic. Yep. You, you got to make sure it looks right when it's in the water. But those silkies, man, you can go for days without oh yeah, without changing it. Exactly. And I think it, even if it adjusts on your hook a little bit too, I mean, it, whether, whichever way it's sitting, it, it works. You yeah. know what I mean? It, it looks yeah. good and, and fish like it. You know what I mean? So, Do you have a favorite color of silky that you go to? Uh, I have a lot of pink in mine. I have a lot of the pink ones in mine. A um, couple blacks, a couple browns. You know, um, I, got, I always have a mixture of colors, honestly. Yeah. Coming from the guy that is least concerned about color too, mind you. So yeah, let's talk about that a little bit because this is one one area where we have a lot of commonality. Mm-hmm. So if, if you're going to take that four millimeter tungsten out of the box, mm-hmm. what color are you grabbing first? Well, I'll just say this. So typically my colors are, you know, if I grab one, it's typically I gravitate towards a, you know, a white or a pink or a, or, you know, an orange or something brighter. I guess that's just it catches my eye, so I just grab it right. <laughs> But I am the least concerned with color. Like, like guys, that's like the, the question I probably get asked the most is, hey, what, what color should we have on? And I, and I every single time tell them it don't matter. Yeah. You know, because once we get you on the right fish, it don't matter what you have on. They're going to bite it, right? So I tell guys, you know, if, if we're struggling and we're not catching fish, I'd rather spend the next hour drilling more holes and finding an active school of fish Versus spending the next hour tying every single jig in your box on to figure out which color is going to trick these neutral fish into biting, right? That, like, I just would rather spend my next hour drilling holes and finding, and once I find that school, which I will, they won't care what you, what color you have on. They're going to bite, you know what I mean? So I guess I am, that I just tell guys, I, I don't, it, color is the least concern of, you know, of my concern, I guess. I, yeah. I would rather just go find more active fish. And I would agree with that. I, and I have the same philosophy when I'm out guiding. Now, I have had times where I've been, you know, with big groups of people fishing just for enjoyment, buddies and everything, or like uh, going to the, the Gens Invitational, which mm-hmm. is almost like, I mean, it's almost like a family reunion mm-hmm. or a homecoming. And you've got a lot of anglers. You've got like 100 anglers out there. And you do see where a color will outperform the other's. Mm-hmm. It's not by much, mm-hmm. but when you're talking about like trying to win something because you've right. caught the big, the biggest fish, mm-hmm. you know, then every little bit counts. But I, I a hundred percent agree with you that I don't push color. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, um, if you have darker water, sometimes it helps to have something that's a little bit brighter, Right. but I don't even see that all the time. Mm-hmm. I mean, sometimes you have the same color jig on it. It seems as the water that you're fishing mm-hmm. and you catch fish. I think I've probably tied the same, like on my personal pole that I use, mm-hmm. I've probably tied the same jig on for the last like two years. Like <laughs> haven't changed color, haven't changed anything, <laughs> literally. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I just, I, I don't worry about color. And like you said, there are times where it might make a little bit of a difference, but yeah. usually when I'm guiding, I'll tell guys, let's let's move. You know, if we're, we're sitting on a bunch of neutral fish that aren't biting, we'll move. We'll yeah. move them before we try to go through our tackle box, I guess. So. Sure. Let's break down a little bit more about just your setup. What what are you doing for line? Um, so on mine, I got a lot of um, 
just mono. I'm I'm pretty basic, pretty basic, you know, um, guy with mono. I like the stretch sometimes because a lot of guys, you know, if there's guys that would have the heavy, heavy hook sets or whatever, yeah. gives that little bit of stretch. We're not yanking them right out of the lips. Um, it also depends on how deep we're fishing too. If we're fishing a little bit deeper, then I do like you know, you know, um, either braid or, or um, floral kind of gives you more sensitivity. Um, but uh, you know, typically um, mono is pretty much what I got on most of my customer rigs. And what pound? Well, in wintertime, three or four. Um, summertime, typically I like to use four, but with customers and we're catching big gills and they're just lifting them right over the side of the boat, I'll put six on just to, you know, so they don't lose a huge one. You know I mean? Typically we try to net them too, but if, you know, I can't net every single one of them. So if someone's yanking one up behind me and I'm netting this one, then at least I know if they got six pound tests, they're not going to lose a giant, you know? Mm -hmm. So I want you to answer this next question a hundred percent honest. Not that you haven't been because I know you are, but I want you to be completely transparent on it. With your own personal rod, not mm -hmm. with your client rods, because I know you treat those differently, but with your own personal rod, the first time that you go ice fishing for the season, do you have new line on the reel? Absolutely. I switch every one of my, all my customer rods, all my personal rods get switched after the season every time. Mm -hmm. And how often are you changing line on your own rod? Um... Every season. Yep. Yeah. See, um, and sometimes multiple times in the season. Depends on, you know, how much usage it gets and, and uh, you know, stuff like that. But um, at least once a season. Yep. Yeah. I'm always running fresh line on all, all our reels. And I think most people do. Um, but, I you know, I, I have clients that come sometimes that they go, oh, you know, I've had this line on for the last three years and it still works. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, nothing against that necessarily until you lose a really big fish. And right. Then, and then it's all those little things that you, you just wish you would have thought of and, and paid attention to those details. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You go, oh, I would have had that, just that trophy fish that I don't have now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, spoons. Tell me about spoons. I mean, you're, you're always going to that tungsten jig. Do you even have them in your box? I have them in my box. Do they get used much? Not very, not personally. But, uh, you know, and I guess I, I think it's everyone's own preference, right? Like I have a couple of guides on my team that they love spoons. Like that's their go-to, right? So like I may be using a, a, a tungsten jig. They're be right beside me using a spoon, you know what I mean? And we're both catching fish. So I think they, they both have a time and place. Um, I definitely, there are times I am using spoons. Um, typically I'll use a spoon on more of aggressive bite when they're more aggressive. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, another thing, you know, we use a lot of pinheads too, you know, mm -hmm. um, those are really good. I mean, so we, we use them, um, me personally, they're not, not on the top of my, um, list of arsenal, I guess, but, um, there's definitely, I definitely do use them from time to time. Do you consider the pinhead a spoon? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I loved, I loved watching you just process that whole question. <laughs> What's your answer to that? The same, really. I mean, it's, it's kind of a hybrid. Yeah. It really it, is. That's, I, that's I, I don't care. You could call it a spoon. Mm -hmm. Sure. You could call it a jig. Mm -hmm. Sure. It, it's probably, it really functions as both. Right. That's Absolutely. why it was tough to, tough to answer yeah. that question. Yeah. I think, I think most people would classify it as a spoon, but I, I guess with the way that I use it for pan fish, I would classify it more as a jig. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Now, do you like the jointed or the the straight? Yes. The jointed? I do too. No, I was going to say oh, yes. Oh, yes to both. both. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 I kind of I kind of like that jointed that jointed yeah. design, you know. Um, but I have both in my arsenal, so. I guess the thing that I found mostly, and, and I've been fishing spoons my most of my life, mm -hmm. most of my life. And um, I, I, I used them for ice fishing before a lot of my buddies did and before... Uh, they became as mainstream as they are, um, but it was because I would catch big fish mm -hmm. on them. Yeah, and, you kind of weed out some of those smaller for ones, sure, right? Absolutely. For sure. And then it was kind of a progression of, oh, I really don't need bait on this. Mm -hmm. And and getting the confidence that you could catch fish without putting wax worms or spikes on there. Mm -hmm. um, but what I found with sunfish is that they really like a spoon or a jig slash spoon like the pinhead 
that they can see it, that they'll come in from a distance. It's like a dinner bell mm -hmm. and, and you can get them to approach from a further distance. But with sunfish on your sonar, you'll see them come up and sit underneath the bait, even when you're rejigging it and moving it. But if they're really aggressive, they'll hit it. But most of the time, they'll just sit and watch until you stop. And if you don't have bait on, you get one swing and you better hit it because otherwise they're gone. Yeah. They get educated real fast. Yeah, that. they do. Yeah. And, and then, but the crappies, that's a different story. Right. You don't stop. Mm -hmm. you, just you just keep, keep moving, yep. keep moving it away from them and they will choke chase. on it. Oh, yeah. Yep. They'll chase and, and then demolish it. Yep. Yeah. You, if you're, if you're using the spooner, specifically the pinhead for uh, crappies, you better make sure that you've got a cold snap toothpick with or mm -hmm. forceps or something like that. Cause oh, they are just going to absolutely. Are you a spoon guy then mainly? I do. I do it all. Do it I all, do yeah. both, okay. but I always have, almost always exclusively, I have a tungsten jig on a rod and a spoon with me at all times, mm -hmm. like in my physical presence. So I'll have one in the rod holder as I'm, you know, jumping from hole to hole with the Vexlar um, and then one in my hand mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. You the same. Um, I would, well, I'm, I always have the tungsten. I always have a, I always have the spoons in my arsenal that are always within arm's reach, but sure. I don't have one rigged up on a rod at all times, I guess. So. Okay. But I could always switch that if I needed to. I like the one, two punch. I like, I yep. like when you can drop a spoon down and, and get a school to come get from a come distance and then, and then drop the tungsten on them. Mm -hmm. That works out pretty slick. Now taking people out and teaching them how to fish. And I know you get a wide range of abilities. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is. It could be somebody that has a lot of experience. They bring their own gear. Mm -hmm. um, you might have somebody who's never set foot on the ice mm -hmm. in their entire life. What are some of the things that you see that you commonly have to coach people on that, that it's kind of like a, almost like a broken record that it doesn't matter how much experience they have, or sometimes it does, but it's something that you find yourself saying almost every day that you take people out. You know, I would say um, detecting the bite. You know what I mean? So a lot of guys are are uh, waiting to feel that thump, right? You know, and, and especially when they're fishing crappies, they're waiting for that thump. Well, you, the crappies that we're fishing aren't going to give you that thump. It's a real light bite, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a lot of, like, coaching, and it's a lot of, like, teaching them how to detect the lightest of bites, right? And, uh, you know, and, and getting them in that mentality where you're going to see it before you feel it, right? Like you, mm -hmm. you want to watch your rod tip. You want to rely on that and you want to see it, you know? Um, so a lot of that is, is, is coaching them how to detect that bite, especially when they're so um, light biting, you know what I mean? And, and part of that is, is the right cadence and part of that is, you know, when that fish is coming up, kind of lifting up a little bit and getting them to chase and, and just, just constant. A lot of guys, you know, what I see is a lot of guys, you know, they're jigging, they got fish coming up and then they just stop and let it sit there. Right. Yeah. And, and then some days that's like, you know, what you need to do. But other days, you know, a lot of times I'm a guy that is constantly jigging, right? Like I'm just constantly working that fish and I'm just like, I, I got my cadence. And when I see my rod tip, load up of even the slightest bit i know it's a fish right so a lot of times it's teaching those guys how to read that and how to do that and, and stuff like that but i would say that's the number one thing is just detecting that light bite yeah. and i you know i would agree with that too um i get some people that don't have a ton of experience with electronics that's part of it too yep, yeah and the, they mm -hmm. and they they focus on you know on the screen too much mm -hmm. that they're constantly watching it and they're missing bites because they're not transferring <laughs> their eyes over to their rod tip. Right. And there's a lot of times. And getting that timing down. Getting right? the when timing. Watching the Vexlar and then switching over to your rod tip. Right. right. Like, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I would say one of the things that I have to coach on more than anything is jigging. That less is more. Mm -hmm. Because I see a lot of people. It doesn't, doesn't matter if we're using a jig or a spoon. That it's almost like they're throwing their jig up into the air. That's I mean, exactly and, and that's what it, it looks like where they're, where they're doing this. And it's like, you don't have to move it that much. You don't very, want to move it that that's much. That's a very good point. And that's, that's, that's probably actually a better answer than mine is because you got guys that are, you know, it's like they're fishing muskies or wallers or something where they're just, you know, <laughs> sorry, they're, 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 their, their rod tips are going up two or three inches. You know what I mean? Like, and you know, that jig is just going like this in the water, right? Like nothing realistic about that at all. Right. So 
again, we try to get them to just to kind of that wrist, you know, just that yeah. flutter and just get that tip just fluttering, you know what I mean? Versus, you know, like this, you know? Yeah. So I, I know that Jesse's passionate about this and, and is excited when he just gets so heated in this discussion <laughs> that he just battle rams his hand into, <laughs> into the microphone as he's doing a yeah, I didn't mean jigging to do imitation. No, it's, <laughs> it's totally good. If you do a hook set and knock it over, I, right? mean, I mean, you probably win an award for that or something. No, I, and you're absolutely right. The, the way that I explain it a lot is it's like putting salt on a steak. Mm-hmm. You know, you're just you're just barely tap, 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 tap. And, and I'll, I'll even show people sometimes as they're trying to work a fish and I'm right, you know, shoulder to shoulder with them. Sometimes I'll reach over and I'll just tap their rod with my finger. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, yeah, that that actually works. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. Like, that's all you need. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I have trouble personally... Um, kind of containing the jigging motion just because I, my, my shoulders are pretty weak. When I get my arm extended out, it starts to shake a bit. Mm-hmm. And so I have to kind of curtail that jigging. And sometimes I'll even put a second hand on the mm-hmm. rod to con- yep. r- really condense that jigging motion. Absolutely. I do the same thing. I do the exact same thing. I think it gives you more control, you know what I mean? Especially yeah. when you're, when you're, you know, finesse jigging and, uh, and you want, uh, you want it more stable, I guess. You know what I mean. So, yeah. um, I, I actually a lot of the guides on my team do the same thing. So, so. Oh, that's good to hear. How, how many guides do you have on your team? Yes, six. Six this winter running running for us. So, and uh, who who are the guys that are working with you? We got Scott Mackner. We got Nick Miller. We got Mike Stein. We got uh, Jaden Peterson, and we got uh, Nick or Cam Miller. Okay, and, and then we got myself, and and of course you, yeah. And Scott Magner, man, mm-hmm. that, that guy is a stud. Yeah, I yeah, mean, he can catch fish, yeah. that's for sure. And if you get a chance, check out his YouTube stuff, too. Yeah, 330 like, Maniac. 330 absolutely. Maniac, for yeah. sure. Well, what are you looking forward to uh, as we you know, get towards the end of winter here? I, I can't believe we're already saying that. I mean, I we're, we're already midway we're, through we're, the we're season. We're midway through the season, but, I mean, we're in the second half of the winter. It seems mm-hmm. like it just started. Uh, this might be the fastest winter I've mm-hmm. ever experienced in my life. I think time goes faster because I'm getting older, uh, but also it's been so mild. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's been great, month. and the wind hasn't been blowing yeah. every single day. It's been that's been great. The roads you plow are staying open that that's you don't right. have to go replow yep. them every it's, hour. Last year I was out there every day because it either blew in or snowed in. You know what I mean? And this year is a is a nice break from from having to do that. Yeah, but what are you looking forward to yet this season? Um, you know, I, I, I love the ice fishing season, right? I love meeting the people. So, I mean, I, uh, I just look forward to the, to more of what we're doing now, to be honest with you. And then obviously, you know, you got late ice coming up. I mean, that's one of the best bites of the season. So we right. always, we always look forward to that. And then, uh, and then we're right into our open water season as soon as our ice is done. We don't get a break in the springtime. So it's, it's go, 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 but we love it. That's why we're here. Um, what's, what's the latest you've ever ice fished? May 7th. And that's not encouraging anybody to try to beat this record. I no, mean, obviously no, God, no. we, we no. want to keep everybody safe. Um, but yeah, that's incredibly late. That Did was catch- with, that was with my grandpa too. But really? Yeah. Yeah. That was, oh gosh, I want to say 10 years ago or so. I don't remember the exact year, but it had to have been about 10, 10 to 15 years ago or so. Oh. oh my gosh, that's bananas! I don't know why we had such late ice, but we were literally out there in t-shirts, um, jeans, and boots, and we literally walked out, caught a bunch of fish, and had a heck of a time. So, so the fishing was good. Fishing was really good, but yeah. that was the absolute latest I can remember. Was it? Was the was the ice at a point where, when you went out to fish, you were a little nervous about being able to get back in? Yeah, we had the we had to stretch the ladder a long ways to get out. <laughs> So is and, that, and grandpa was hardcore like that. So he would do that. You know what I mean? So. Is that your go-to is, is bring an extension ladder with to lay out when we need to. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Or else I, I've built like a wooden bridge now, a super long one that I kind of carry with me too. So we'll make whatever we need to make it work. <laughs> I think that's great. I, I love, I love the late ice period. Um, chip Lear years ago. And I love chip, you know, he's done so many incredible things in the fishing industry and um, just like any legendary angler, he has some great quotes. And one of them was, you know, we ice fish all year long, but really we're all just waiting for March. Mm-hmm. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. That's exactly it. And there's a lot of truth to that. 
before we go, do you have any any stories from clients that you've taken out in the last you know handful of years that really stand out for you, or an experience that was so memorable, um, you know, that it comes up in conversation over and over again? You know, that's a good question. I guess I uh, I'd have to think about that one. I mean, we got a lot of great stories of, of guys, you know, and and we have nothing but good groups. So. Um, you know, I think one of the coolest things, I guess, that happened this summer was we had a, a gal, she's probably in her mid fifties, if not closer to 60, hadn't caught a fish before or had never been, she lived in Minnesota her life, her whole life, but had never been fishing before in her whole life. So, um, she had family come up from California. So her and a couple of her family members came out with me in the boat this summer. And again, mind you, this is her very first time fishing, but she ended up catching a, uh, 29 and a half inch walleye and I think like six gills over 10 inches. Jesse. First time fishing ever. You've you know, ruined like, her. Uh, yeah. Like I, now she thinks that's what fishing is going to be like right, every single time. Right. Yeah. I, I explained to her that it, uh, it, it's not like this every single time. <laughs> that, uh, you've been pretty fortunate. You know, guys go their whole lives to catch a 10 inch gill and some guys go their whole lives to catch a 29 and a half inch walleye. So and you did it all in one day. I'd have to say some of the absolute best outstanding days that I've ever had guiding have been with people who really didn't understand what they had accomplished. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, it, it, she thought she was going to take that walleye home and eat it. I mean, it's like she didn't yeah. know any better. She just thought, Oh, food, you know, and I had to kind of explain to her kind of same thing with that 15 inch right. copy, you know, like, Hey, you can legally take this home and eat it, but it's probably not, you know, it's, you'd be better off if you're going to take it home, put it on the wall or, release it and let someone else catch it. And she released it. So that's awesome. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't tell you how many people have caught a trophy fish like that, that have like never caught a walleye before and caught a trophy walleye or, you know, never, never caught a muskie before. Mm -hmm. And, and like in their never even musky fish before. And then in like their first 15 minutes, they catch one. And then you have somebody that's fished for you know, the last decade and they've never landed one. Right. It's just, you know, the fishing gods are interesting in that regard. That's, uh, that's one thing I've never done is musky fished. I should oh, probably really? do that sometime. Yeah. Hopefully I'm one of the like 15 minute people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then I'd ruin you. And then, okay, here's what would happen. You'd catch a, catch a musky in your first 15 minutes. You'd love it so much that you'd go and spend your life savings on musky gear. Mm -hmm. And that's all you would fish for the rest of your life. Cause that's the way it goes with a lot of musky anglers. I heard I, that. Once, I almost, you, once you catch your first one, you're hooked, right? It doesn't even take that. Even just seeing one and your heart wants to jump out of your chest. It, it's easy to get addicted. I'd probably have to lift weights probably like a month or two before yeah, I even I started know. that you throwing them, know. throwing them bulldogs or whatever you guys are throwing out, you know, <laughs> so that's pretty heavy jigs and heavy setups. You're in good shape. I think you'll be fine. <laughs> I will. I will tell you though. It's a, it's exactly. It's exactly forty minutes. If somebody wants to musky fish who's never done it before, and you start casting those big lures, it is forty minutes before they start bending over and stretching and you know stretching their shoulders and going, "Wow, this is, this is a lot of work." I'm still carrying a little holiday weight, so it'd probably only be like fifteen <laughs> minutes for me. <laughs> no, I think you. I think you'd do okay. We'd have a backup plan. Perfect. <laughs> Well, Jesse, if you were going to give any bit of advice, and before we go, you know, we've been talking here on the Ice Team Podcast for about an hour in the Perm Public Library. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, it's been nice I'm and I'm surprised quiet. they haven't kicked us out yet. It's almost closing time, I bet. Yeah, we're just about ready to wrap it up here. So anything you want to share with our listeners before we get out of here? Nothing other than just go fishing any chance you get. You know what I mean? You can't catch them from the couch. So um, get out, enjoy the great outdoors, and, uh, and uh, yeah, go fishing. Go fishing. Well, Jesse, how can somebody get a hold of you if they are interested in booking a trip? So my phone number is 320-290-2035. You can go to our website, thalmansguideservice.com, or check out our Facebook page, Thalmans Guide Service. We post, uh, we post pics daily of our trips, so you can kind of see what we're catching, when we're catching, and, and kind of follow along for the ride. So, All right. Well, thanks for joining us on the Ice Team Pod Podcast, and thank you, Jesse Thalman, hey, for joining you. us, man. Thanks for having Always me. Always an absolute pleasure to be in your presence. So make sure you follow us on social media, uh, Ice Team on Facebook, Instagram, and, of course, check out our other podcast because we have a lot of really great guests on. So this is Jason Durham reminding you to be safe, to be smart, and be a hero. 
take somebody ice fishing. Just like Jason.